fits to uncover the true nature of that source. But of course, that requires accurate models for all of these effects. And the goal of the study really is to focus on the direction dependent antenna gain and to um, we address calibration of uh, this parameter through providing accurate models. So what we're working towards is um, a pattern model that um, is described in this um, in this form, which is just a weighted sum of a number of basis functions. And of course, um, well, in this model, the unknown parameters that need to be solved are the weighting coefficients for the various basis functions. And these are, of course, time and frequency dependent. And of course, we need the full polarization information of the patterns. And ideally, there would be a trade-off between the number of terms and the accuracy of the model. And and really, the focus is to define suitable basis functions that minimize the number of um, basis functions that we need for accurate model, which also then minimizes the number of model parameters that need to be solved. Um, yes, yeah, so we're in the search of in search of these optimal functions. So we consider two approaches. The first one is the use of analytic pattern functions. Now we did this for reflector antenna. So an obvious place to start is based on a series solution for reflector antenna patterns, which basically starts with expanding um, the aperture distribution um, into a trigonometric Fourier series for azimuthal variation and using the Kirby polynomials for the radial variation, which translates into a far field, which is expanded again into Fourier transform uh, Fourier series for the azimuth variation and the combination of Bessel and rational functions for um, the, the elevation angle dependence. So, in the original application, um, we know the primary pattern, and as an antenna engineer, when I refer to primary pattern, I actually mean the feed that illuminates reflected, um, which I notice is actually um, a different from the radio astronomy perspective. Um, but in any case, from that, calculate the current distribution on the reflector, or the um, aperture field distribution. Use that to um, calculate the model coefficients, and from that, calculate the secondary pattern. Now, of course, in practice, the um, antenna pattern that you get out is not necessarily the, um, the ideally expected pattern. So here we're actually using, we're sort of working in reverse, where we know the secondary pattern at a few points. And from that, we need to estimate the model coefficients to calculate a secondary pattern um, using these basis functions. So looking at how we estimate the coefficients, the first approach, we just uh, did normal point patching. So we have a certain number of basis functions in our model, which um, requires us solving a certain number of coefficients. So we use the same number of measurements. We stack the basis functions um, sampled in various directions into our system matrix, sampled the unknown reference pattern, and use that to solve the unknown coefficients. So we did this for uh, the Meerkat optical system with a horn feed, where we just applied a small um, positioning error of the feed and the sub -reflector. And we sampled the reference pattern within a certain um, angular range, and then computed um, models with various numbers of um, expansion nodes. So the first model, which is a zeroth order expansion, basically is just the Jing function. That's a single term. So you get this green line. And if you increase your order of expansion by one, you get a much closer match, this yellow line. And then when we further increase the number of modes, we actually run into a problem. So you see that the model then starts to diverge around the edges or at uh, larger angular uh, regions. And this is mainly to do with how the basis functions are defined. So the order of the basal function, which uh, has an impact on how your elevation angle vari variation is modeled. Uh, looking at the low order modes, we have a single term which is non-zero on axis. And then as the order of the basal functions increase, of course, the um, sort of the region of um, dominance for the basis functions are shifted upward. So, and this order is actually dependent on both your azimuthal mode and your um, elevation angle mode. So when you look at the uh, higher order azimuthal variation, you actually see um, sort of relatively large region where your basis functions are zero. So we try to compensate for this by actually redefining um, the order of our basal function which is then just um, n plus 1 instead of the n plus 2 n plus 1. And then we actually see that, first of all, we're filling in more um, basis functions into the same angular region. And for the higher order azimuthal variation, we also have uh, more degrees of freedom in that range. Of course, um, 
This is at the cost of only modeling a smaller angular region and using the same number of basis functions. So again, modeling the same patterns, but this time with uh, the different basis functions and actually see that uh, adding more modes uh, you don't run into that problem where the model diverges um, with the same number of modes. So comparing the two sets of basis functions more quantitatively, um, we show here in blue line, blue solid line shows how the model accuracy, and this is the um, average relative error um, up to 20 dB down in percentage. Um, at first, we see that the error decreases, but as we add more modes, this is um, number of expansion modes, the error actually starts to um, increase rapidly, whereas with the new definition of the basis functions, the error can be pushed down um, by around an order of magnitude, magnitude by adding uh, more functions. And uh, just for reference, we show in these dotted lines where we actually use the weighted residual approach um, using full knowledge of the actual pattern that we're trying to model, just to show sort of um, some best case scenario which shows uh, sort of limiting uh, limit that we're able to reach with uh, various models. So we also considered a second approach to um, computing these coefficients looking at constraint solution. So in practice, uh, an approximate pattern for the actual pattern is um, known, so we'll just call this one the ideal expected pattern. And this is obtained through accurate simulations or on a direction by direction uh, measure, uh, yeah, computed from a direction by direction measurement. And then we can use, again, weighted residuals to um, find the best model uh, for that pattern. But in practice, of course, the pattern is um, slightly perturbed from that ideally expected pattern, and this is, of course, due to various um, conditions such as wind loading or gravitational loading, um, which is also variable in time. So in this case, we need to uh, estimate the pattern from only a very few number of measurements. So if we can make the assumption that these two patterns are relatively similar, then, of course, it also makes sense that the coefficients um, should be relatively similar. So in this case, um, we would take the ideally expected pattern, and in this case, we used um, the Meerkat optical system with one feed exactly, um, or a zero error in the feed in some perfect position. And we calculate through weighted residual approach best coefficients to model that pattern. And then we simulated an unknown reference pattern where we applied, again, a small error in the feed and sub effect position. And then we, um, to get an estimate model for that pattern, we take a number of measurements, um, and then we try to minimize the difference between the ideal uh, pattern co model coefficients and the reference pattern model coefficients subject to a number of measurement constraints. So over here, we show um, just the blue line is the expected pattern, and the red line is the actual one um, with the feed and sub reflected area included. And then on the right, we show our various models of various order of expansion, um, how the error decreases with the number or changes, actually, uh, according to the number of measurements. So we see that at first, with relatively few measurements, we can get the error, error down um, uh, to relatively low level. Um, and note also that this is using the original definition of the basis functions where we had previously that um, error that started to diverge as we included the number of um, modes in our expansion. However, if we uh, add more and more measurements, then actually you see that the error again starts to diverge as we had earlier. And this is because um, of those uh, constraints or those measurement constraints. So looking at a different constraint solution, which actually then tries to minimize this cost function uh, where we have this uh, trust factor. We actually see, again, as on the previous slide, the error at first the decreasing, but then adding more measurements doesn't actually cause the model error to increase rapidly. Now, of course, this requires uh, some uh, trust factor that we have to select. So just on the right, we show um, using different number of measurements uh, the red lines indicate number of measurements from 1 to 15. Um, and on the horizontal axis, we have this thrust, thrust factor. So um, obviously, if we have a large thrust factor, that means we have large confidence in our ideally expected pattern, which means that it doesn't matter how many measurements you actually take. Um, 
to find the perturbed pattern, you're actually still fixed at the ideally expected um, pattern, which causes this relatively large error. However, if we uh, reduce the dominance of this term, um, adding more measurements, the uh, model actually error becomes more accurate. Um, yeah. Okay, so that was the analytic basis functions, and then the next approach that we consider is also the use of characteristic basis function patterns. Now, uh, in this model, uh, what we use is actually a number of radiation patterns that result from various system configurations. Um, those patterns we actually use as a basis functions for our model. So we have what we call the primary CVFP, and this is the radiation pattern that cons corresponds to the perfect system. So supposing that there are certain um, errors that we anticipate to be present in the actual system as it is built, then we can also generate a number of secondary CVFPs where we um, measure or simulate perturbed patterns after introducing various of these anticipated errors. So with that, we end up with uh, this set of CVFPs that we try to model the perturbed patterns. And as I just mentioned, these uh, patterns can be obtained either through measurement or simulation or combination of both. So we apply this um, again to the Meerkat system to compensate for pattern errors resulting from the feed and sub effect of displacement. So here we just show an exaggerated scale of tolerances um, for the positioning error of the sub effective. So to generate our CBFP, the error of the sub effective position is set to zero. We measure the pattern or obtain it through simulation um, on a dense grid over a wide angular region. And then to obtain secondary patterns, we apply a certain positioning error to the field and the sub-reflective. And for each of those errors, we calculate again or measure again a radiation pattern. And these then form the set of our basis functions. So over here, I just show um, the primary basis function in solid blue line, and the dashed lines indicate uh, two of the secondary basis function patterns. Um, and I show, or as can be seen, these uh, errors may result in a pointing error. However, there's also some uh, change in the sidelob structure. So as we add more and more of these basis functions, it actually um, turns out that uh, at some point you increase the level of redundancy in your system. So what we do is we stack again the basis functions in the matrix, um, as columns in the matrix, um, use singular value decomposition, and then only use the first few columns of um, of this U matrix, first few uh, left singular uh, vectors, which correspond uh, to singular values above a certain tolerance. <laughs> and then we actually use those columns as our basis for So the primary one um, still looks uh, more or less the same as we had before the SVD, but the secondary basis functions are then a uh, lot different. So here yeah, we just show the results um, of the accuracy that we can obtain with this method, and uh, again, um, just using point matching in this case to solve for the um, coefficients. So on the left, the blue line is the expected pattern, and the right one is the, or the red one is the, um, uh, the, sorry, the green one is the reference pattern. And then the CVFP model pattern using the nine models is uh, the red one. So um, the difference is. Uh, quite small and only really visible on this scale um, from around minus 30 or minus 40 dB. And on the right-hand side, we show um, how the model error increase, uh, decreases with the number of CVFPs. So with around six basis functions um, at uh, 1750 megahertz, the error is uh, around 0.1%. And then after we actually see a uh, um, the error doesn't improve uh, much more with adding more basis functions. And solid line shows the result after applying the SVD to the basis functions. And the dashed line shows um, if we use the, the radiation patterns without the SVD. So um, this just clearly shows uh, how the solution accuracy is actually improved uh, through the use of that SVD. And in total, we only generated a num uh, total of nine characteristic basis functions. So in that case, you actually expect um, both before and after SVD to yield more or less the same level of accuracy. And expectedly, when we look at the results for the lower frequency, 
um, this ob obviously the same tolerances for the beam sub-reflective um, uh, position apply, but the effect on the radiation pattern is um, a lot less at this frequency, so the model accuracy is um, equivalently uh, improved. All right, so that was uh, the two sets of basis functions, and then uh, just finally um, some uh, beamforming approaches that we've considered, which is, of course, applicable to uh, dense array feed-based systems, which offer the advantage of a large field of view, however, at the cost of increased calibration complexity. Um, now, beamforming techniques offer us some more flexibility, and this is commonly used to improve the pattern performance in terms of uh, sensitivity of side of it. However, there's also been a re recent focus on improving calibration efficiency. So um, the proposed propo uh, approach here is to use a linearly constrained minimum variance uh, beamforming scheme, which conforms the radiation pattern to a certain analytic um, function, uh, which is shown here. So this is just um, the gene function, uh, with uh, k is the wave number, a is your uh, effective uh, radius, and then we've included this beam with scan uh, parameter S, and we've also added uh, this uh, phase factor, which uh, is um, uh, which is actually used to model the shift in the position of the phase center um, as the antenna is scanned. So the idea here is to choose these parameters. Uh, this is a two-parameter model, so we choose these two parameters to give us the certain um, result performance in the uh, form secondary beam. Um, so this is uh, purely used as the model at first to define um, the pattern to which the actual pattern is conformed using this uh, constrained beam format. But then to model that realized pattern, we use exactly the same function with the exact same uh, parameters. So the question is how do we optimize these parameter values to get the desired performance? Um, and what we did was to create a number of um, beams uh, over in a field of view, which uh, was just to maximize the activity. And then you can actually derive these two, uh, you can derive initial model parameters um, equivalent to those max directivity beams. And then afterwards, um, the parameter values are adjusted further to fine tune the desired performance. Um, so we did a parameter study for the Meerkat and the, uh, with the denser feed. And it turns out that um, for this beam width scaling, approximately equal to less than the equivalent for the ma maximum directivity um, value, we are ensured an accurate model um, over a large range of uh, this uh, parameter value. And then we see expectedly a trade off between directivity and side of it. And for this phase gradient parameter, the best uh, performance is obtained um, in terms of directivity side load level and model accuracy if we choose it equal to the max scenario problem. Um, so we went ahead and designed the, such a beam former to give us side load level less than uh, minus 17 dB over three to three or a field of view extending three degrees off axis. And then we compared it to a maximum directivity beam form. So this just shows the result. So on the top we show the scan loss um, over the field of view. So Clearly and expectedly, the max directivity uh, beamformer shows a lot less scan loss. The, the solid line shows a 1 dB scan loss. Um, with LCMB, uh, we have a smaller field of view. And when we look at the aperture efficiency greater than 70%, this field of view is reduced by around 18%. However, when we look at the um, model error, or the error in our single-term model, we see that um, the max directivity um, the informer again has a lot larger error. So this black line just shows a 5% average relative error, um, which is, yeah, uh, the model error is um, less than this value of the field of view for the LCMB view. So in the end, we end up with the trade off between calibration um, efficiency and uh, capture efficiency. Um, so in summary, we aim to provide accurate and efficient uh, beam calibration models. So looking at the analytic basis functions, what's nice about that is we have a general model and we can add um, a lot of uh, general terms to uh, model hopefully any kind of error. However, this is a large number of terms and perhaps constraint solution um, 
it's possible, or it seems a constrained solution is possible to overcome uh, this predicament. Looking at characteristic basis functions, um, they of course have the advantage that they are much more efficient, requiring uh, fewer terms, um, and they're uh, applied to compensate for certain anticipated errors. So it is um, what's interesting to see is, is how well these uh, basis functions would perform then for um, other kinds of errors as well. And uh, using constrained beamforming approach, we just came to uh, a trade-off between calibration efficiency and pattern performance. So what's next? Well, um, of course, there are a lot more analytic basis functions that can be considered. So hopefully, we'll get to these in time. And uh, for the CBFPs, to, uh, we'll apply this also then to other kinds of anticipated errors. And whereas we now looked at a specific uh, kind of error, or just a single kind of error, if there are multiple um, different errors in the system at the same time, it would be interesting to see how the method can be used in such a case. Um, and what's interesting is uh, if there is some hybrid solution possible using both analytic and characteristic basis functions. And then, importantly, what, um, what hasn't been done here yet is this frequency dependence. And we've seen a lot of that today. And also, there are some interesting uh, results for the offset recording system where you have uh, certain deterministic frequency methods. So uh, it would also be interesting to see how I can incorporate that. And then finally, experimental evaluation of these approaches um, to see how well these uh, models actually perform in an actual um, science case where you do full um, calibration imaging uh, to see how well these models perform. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. So do you, do you do uh, error propagation? I'm talking about the blog of the discussion. Do you, have you done an error propagation analysis where you say the, you translate the errors in the measurements in the past field right. onto the errors in the coefficients of, of the functions? And not just the errors, but also the correlation matrix. Right? OK. No, actually, I think that will give you uh, useful insight about you know, how many functions you can use. Right? So you just like you just take the thermal estimate of the error in the far field, okay. and you do the same you know, conversion process essentially of that, you get a various matrix of errors. And the solution. Okay. So okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Plus, I have other, <laughs> other suggestions that we can <laughs> Yeah, okay, no, I'm sure we can get you off. They're missing function of the first kind, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Uh, did you go, how did you compute them? Uh, you, you mean the specialized package to compute progressive functions? Oh, yeah, just uh, in that, just call the or something like that. Yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, standard thing is showing you 30 for an algorithm. 30 for an algorithm? Yeah, but uh, I suppose um, that would be in the LM plane. Uh, sort of in the triple plane. Yeah. In what? In the triple plane, right? Yeah, in the triple plane, yeah. yeah. So what happens then, for example, if you have a gravitational deformation of the dish, yeah. it corresponds very closely to stigmatism. So you get, it corresponds quite closely to physical deformations of the dishes. So you know, you'd use it on the GVT, for example. To um, yeah, I think uh, those uh, Jacobi polynomials. Uh, they're, it's, they're yes. close, they're yeah, they're closely yeah. related. Yeah. I've got a question. How far uh, how far out in the side loops do you go? Because this question came up earlier during my talk. Can we, you know, if you want to simulate side lobe randomization due to environmental effects of surface, right? Then we're talking about really distant side lobes. So how how far away did you try this approach? Um, well, the errors were shown uh, down to 20 dB, which for this case was only over the main uh, main division. Side lobes, I think, right. are much higher than that. But uh, looking at the results. For uh, characteristic basic functions, okay. actually it shows uh, you can actually model the first three side loops are quite accurately. Uh, right. So, it, but but you haven't looked beyond the, the first three. Really. No, no, not, not in some kind of 
course, most of the side is actually comes from the first three, first few, but still it will be interesting to see the performance of this for distant side loops. Oh, yes, okay. Okay, anybody else? Ask another question. You showed before the graph for the error in trees. Would you have the same oh. positive, uh, positive indefinite system? Like yeah. Have you checked the condition number of the graph? Uh, yes, you actually. So uh, in traces. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker.